of Science and History Pink Palace in Memphis, Tennessee. Did you know that Memphis's first museum was an octagonal room at the top of the city's first library? Memphians filled it to the brim with minerals, antiquities, taxidermy, and more. The museum soon outgrew its library home, and in 1930, the collection became the basis for a brand new museum in Clarence Saunders' converted pink marble mansion. You can visit a recreation of the Casa Museum Room in the Mansion Galleries at the Museum of Science and History Pink Palace. You won't believe how much museums have changed. Good afternoon to those of you in the central time zone and wherever you're watching, we welcome you. My name is Les Kerr. It's always a great pleasure to be a part of the Southern Festival of Books. On behalf of Humanities Tennessee and the Southern Festival, we would like to welcome you to this great event. We would also take, like to take a moment to thank our key sponsors, the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. By the way, this author's book is available at Parnassus Books. We appreciate their support in making the festival possible. And it is my pleasure to host Heather L. Montgomery, author of the book, Who Gives a Poop? Heather Montgomery has taught for over 20 years, both inside and outside the classroom, as well as directed a school-based environmental center. She has written curriculum, trained hundreds of teachers, naturalists, and librarians, She's helped thousands of children make friends with the natural world. Each year, she works directly with over 10,000 children at festivals, school events, and environmental centers. During a typical presentation, petrified body parts and tree guts encourage scientific thinking and inspire reluctant readers. Her professional development programs for teachers have won awards and rave reviews. Heather, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. Yay! We are, and, delighted that we are delighted that you're here. And I'm so excited about my new book, Who Gives a Poop? Sorry, having trouble getting it in the screen there. That's what we, <laughs> what we do these days. I hope that everybody who's joining us is prepared. Maybe they brought their uh, gloves. Every, everybody Maybe, has them around these days, I think. Of course. Well, the thing is, yeah, those masks, <laughs> that no one had guess who had a bunch of them because i had been studying poop for years and i was well prepared before covid came around the other thing i had was poop goggles and i mean the literal goggles to save my eyes and keep me protected but i also mean goggles a lens that let me see the world through poop i mean that's just a weird thing right most people don't do that um, but those of us who are naturalists, we are. We look at the world at poop all the time. We call it scat, though, you know, scat stories. I'm excited today to share with you the surprising science from one end to the other, stories behind the story and my research process, because that's what I love. I love digging in literally with my hands, uh, sometimes elbow deep. Um, and discovering the story that's behind the science. It's amazing, right? There's this crazy stuff. I mean, I meet these people who pick up poop all the time. I meet people who make poop slurries. Mm, yeah, slurries. Uh, and people who love poop coffee. And then there are the folks that have an entire freezer full of feces. Weird, right? It's kind of crazy. but. It's also kind of cool. I'm going to share that story with you today. This is the end product. Who gives a poop? Surprising science from one end to the other. But when I started this and when I was going through it, I had no idea what this story would do to me as an individual. Sure, I'm a naturalist and I've been out there looking at poop for years and years and years. But this story went a lot deeper deeper than I ever knew or expected it would go. 
We'll start with some fun, right? I was driving down the road one day and I saw something tragic. It was a coyote who'd been killed. This coyote was laying on the side of the road and I pulled the car over and I jumped out and I whipped out my tongue collecting kit because you know, everybody has one of those in their car. No, really, I have a tongue collecting kit specifically for roadkill coyotes because there's a scientist who needs DNA out of coyotes. So I went after that coyote to help her out. She, she needed this and it was, well, it was tragic that this coyote had lost its life. But I had learned in writing an earlier book, Something Rotten, A Fresh Look at Roadkill, how valuable those specimens are. You know, animals that get hit, they don't, they, their life doesn't have to be just complete loss. So there I am collecting this tongue and thinking about this coyote and, you know, my heart's going out to her because she didn't deserve that. Um, but I packed that tongue bit in a little vial with these little beads to desiccate it. And, and I was about to ship it off to the scientist. And I was kind of, kind of sad because I didn't know her story. Now the scientist was going to figure out a lot from looking at the DNA, but my connection to her was gone. And I'm heading back to the car and I almost trip over this pile of poop. And it occurs to me that that poop, which obviously was coyote, look at those persimmon seeds in it, right? That scat was the last story that this coyote had a chance to tell. And what if I actually looked at it with that lens? Like I said, I've been stirring poop for a long time, but I'd never really thought about all of the backstory that was contained. Like, which holler did she howl in last night? Those persimmon seeds could tell. There was so much in there, but I didn't know how to find that out. So. I went looking. I went looking for scientists who study scat and see what they could find out. Now, here's the thing. There's so much fecal fun. I mean, there are stories about poop all over the place. I bet some of the people listening today have a fecal fun fact. If you have a fecal fun fact, go ahead and toss it in the comments. It'll make its way over here to me and maybe I can share it, right? I mean, who knows? Maybe Les has a fun fecal fact. I'll tell you a few while you think. So say you're in Hawaii and you've got your toes in that sand. Little did you know, your toes and your sandcastle might be being made with poop from the parrotfish. Yes, these crazy cuties, they grind through coral. Yeah, that's what they eat. And as they do that mm, out the other end, you know what comes out. Then think of that next time you're building a sandcastle. There's this guy, crazy, amazing scorpions. Now imagine you're a scorpion and a bird is coming at you. The place they're gonna grab is your tail, right? That's most likely. This scorpion can self amputate. It can actually choose to let his tail go at one of those three locations. That's awesome. But he's lost his number one weapon. The real problem though is number two because he now has lost his hole at his rear end. It all seals up tight and he has no way to go-go. What is he going to do, right? That's crazy fun fecal facts. Any of you have fun fecal facts to share? The thing is, poop is full of power. There are stories behind every pile. Once I started really looking into this, I talked to my friends about it, of course, because, you know, who can help it? I mean, you know, I am going around collecting things like this, right? I don't know if you can see all the hairiness in there. And I'm like, why is it all hairy? And who left this? And what did they eat? And as I'm asking those questions, I'm talking to all the people around me. And they, they know me. They're like, okay, Heather's into some strange stuff this now. But they start sending me stuff, right? Any connection to this, this story. So a friend sends me this screenshot. It's called Got Guts. It's a citizen science project that's asking you to take pictures of guts and send them in. 
Well, I was interested in guts because, of course, one of the questions about poop is, well, how is it actually made? I mean, sure, it's your food that goes through and some magic happens, right? And it comes out the other end. But no, really, what's actually going on in there? So, you know, I had roadkill in my freezer. So, yeah, when I found this uh, beaver, yeah, I decided to take a look at the beaver guts and I laid them out. Oh, it was. Yes, it's disgusting, but it's actually fascinating. I mean, all of that fit in the belly of the beaver, and the belly was no bigger than this. I had just pulled it out myself, but I really didn't kind of get how all that happened. Like, how did it all fit in there? And what was all this stuff about anyway, right? And like, why were they so interested in guts? They actually wanted to measure them. So you see my yardstick there. I was measuring the guts of the beaver, and they were asking hunters specifically to send in the guts of deer and ducks and whatever animals that they found. I wanted to know what was behind this. So I, I email the scientist behind it, Dr. Erin McKinney, and it was phenomenal to talk to her. She explained all of the digestive system. You never really know about all the parts, including the cecum. I was like, what's a cecum? Well, it turns out that's what we, we call our appendix, but animals have cecums, and they're all different sizes. You see, Erin loves the guts, too. Um, she really loves lemurs, and lemurs are phenomenal. Erin was studying the difference in the gut length of all these different lemurs. Come to find out, they all have different diets, and there was a connection there. And it made me start to wonder, wait a second, what about my guts, right? I mean, I really was not interested in human poop, believe me, that was not my thing. Uh, but the guts, and why was this study so important? Well, she's not finished her study yet, but she did look in human guts and she discovered that women's small intestines are longer than men. And we didn't know that. And why is that? And what does that matter? These are the questions that, that folks who are looking into poop wonder about. <laughs> oh, and then I got into this study. I am about biology. I like life science physics. I do not get, but this story, oh my goodness, I met this lady, Patricia Yang. She was awesome. Let me read you this poem. Joanna Science uh, wrote this poem or illustrated this poem. It says, you might think this study is crap, but don't give scientists a bad rap. To study how animals poo, they took video at the zoo. <laughs> really, they did this. <gasps> and found all mammals defecate at the very same rate, at about. 12 seconds per poop, plus or minus seven, to be precise. What? Why is what I wanted to know. But Patricia, she's got this physics mind, and she wanted to know how. Again, it's this crazy study that's about feces. It's kind of funny, right? But so what? What I didn't realize is that she's studying the animal bodies and their systems. We can correlate that to society and how we treat feces. And that's important, right? But again, I wasn't interested in that stuff. I wanted to know about the animals, right? That's the story I was after. I was chasing it. Gosh, the animal stories, there were so many. I mean, people use poop for all kinds of things. This story blew my mind. It's about dogs and dung and DNA and this little elephant cutie. Well, you probably have heard that there's a problem we have, and that's our elephant population is drip dropping because, well, people like ivory and the ivory cartel, it's rough. It's a real rough thing. Well, we're not taking it sitting down. Here's the problem. You know, we have wildlife rangers, and the rangers can go out, and they can protect the elephants. 
But the elephants are all scattered across a continent, right? Either Africa or Asia. They're all over the place. So how do you know where to send the rangers? There's a lot of land to cover. That's where dogs come to the rescue. And specifically, little canisters of dung. If you train a dog to find elephant dung, that's the first step. Well, how do you do that? You go to a zoo and you get elephant dung and you put it in these little canisters and you train the dog to find them. You hide them all over the place. You train the dogs to find dung, but only fresh dung. And then you travel to Africa and you take those dogs and you go track down some dung. When you get that dung, you gather it up. And from that dung, you find the elephant DNA. Now, I didn't understand this because I thought, well, the DNA that's in the dung would be all from the food. But what I didn't realize, ha, but Patricia Yang had taught me, is that when bodies Mm, digest, that dung needs a way to slide through. And as it's sliding through the uh, colon and the rest of the intestinal tract, there's a mucus that comes off. That's what makes it kind of shiny. But also with that mucus, all little cells from the epithelium, the skin of the colon, come off. And so when you pick up dung, that outside edge has DNA of the animal in it. So you collect all this DNA and you map it. They actually put the DNA, they record the DNA, they read the DNA, and they put it in a big database. So you have a database of DNA for elephants. The thing about elephants travel in families, their DNA is connected. And then you have this map of where elephants live. All right, well, that's all well and good. What good does that do you in terms of the ivory? We can catch those people who are shipping the ivory. We just don't know where it's coming from. So if you catch a shipment of ivory and you drill into that ivory, you're going to get the DNA of that elephant. So then you match that to the database and then you match that to the map and you send your rangers there. And this is how dung and dogs and DNA has shut down the two largest ivory cartels in the world. That is some powerful stuff. See what I'm saying? There's power in this poo, right? There's so much there that if we just look at it, really are willing to look at this animal poop, man, we can save species. And I was jazzed about that. I was having a blast with this stuff. Oh, by the way, it's not just elephants. This dog right here, Athena, she was trained to track pangolin poo. What's a pangolin? It's this amazing creature that happens to be the number one most trafficked mammal in the world. And their populations are dropping. They're very secretive. They live in these holes and they're killed one to get their scales. And so there's a group right now working hard to train dogs. It's not easy because you can't even get pangolin poo very easily. They're training these pups to track pangolins and do the same thing. Wow, this is exciting stuff. I bet you have a scat story. If there's anyone out there who has a scat story to share, go ahead and toss it in the comments. Send it in to us because we want to know, I want to hear your story. There's so much to learn. The thing about science, though, is it doesn't always go exactly as planned. For example, you know, in my studies, I came across somebody whose job it was to track these cute little bob white, bob white quail chicks right? She put these transmitters on them. You can probably see the little antenna sticking up. And that, she went with a little radio transmitter doo -doo 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 -doo, and tried to track them. She was trying to figure out where these guys go. Well, sometimes 
she discovered her transmitters in not the most pleasant of places. This chick had disappeared because, well, let's just say its transmitter turned up in coyote poop. <gasps> right? What? <sighs> not exactly as planned. This scientist had caught this cub, this cuddly bear cub. Well, not really cuddly. It's a wild animal. Don't worry. It's uh, tranquilized here. And she's holding this animal as she's getting her samples she needed. Well, the problem was with all that bear in her hands, she didn't have anywhere to put the poop samples. So pop, <laughs> she had to hold it in her mouth. <laughs> what? <sighs> Doesn't always go as planned. Well, my research hadn't always gone as planned either. I had this idea that I was just going to track all these scientists with these great stories and it was going to be awesome. But it didn't always turn out the way I wanted. So here is an example. You know, across the world, people have always used poop as fuel. I thought, oh, that's amazing, right? Let's turn this animal feces, this stuff we call waste, into something wonderful, fuel that we could use, right? So I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I got a neighbor to kindly contribute some cow pies, and that's my dog, Piper, who uh, joins me in all my treks. Piper and I were like, okay, let's, first of all, I have to look at this poop up close, right? Because that's what I do. So I get my journal out, and here I am taking a nice close. Look, oh, there's all kinds of cool stuff in this poop. That's a beetle hanging out. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, maybe I need to dry it first because I don't want to, you know, burn these animals. Um, and besides that, it's probably going to, um, it's going to be hard to, to burn, right? It's got all this moisture in it because it had all this plant stuff. So I sat it out on my porch for quite a while and let it dry. And then I'm like, okay, this is the time. I'm going to I'm going to brew my tea over cow pies. That was what my decision was. So here I am setting up to do this. All right. I'm so excited. Like, this is going to be great. I'm going to save some fossil fuels. I'm going to do this amazing stuff. And I didn't exactly go as I planned. You see that stuff that's burning? That's not the cow pie. The cow pie is just sitting there looking at me. I had to stuff all of the newspaper I could under. I spent like an hour trying to get that cow pie to burn. And wait a second, I'm a camper. I know how to build fire. I broke it into bits. I added in some extra fire starter. I did all of this stuff. And it definitely was not going as planned. My tea water, oh. Eventually, eventually, it started to turn a little bit brown, but there were all of these, well, let's just say some flecks in there, some extra tasty flecks. Not my idea of delightful tea. That's not the only part that went uh, a little wrong. Well, I said to myself, wait a second, wait a second. There are people who are doing this. They're turning stool into fuel. And if I can't do it, I've got to go to the experts and figure out who's doing it. There's a guy named Brian Harper. He had a problem. You see, everybody, everybody, everybody walked their dog right past his house. And there was some poop. And not everybody picked it up, right? He had another problem. There were these lanterns in his community that were supposed to be lit by a gas but there was no gas to light them. Brian is a tinkerer. Brian thought, wait a second, I know something about feces and fuel. He went down into his laboratory, literally it's an underground laboratory, and he started tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. He wanted to do something about this problem, and this is what he did. I will read to you. Finally, Brian had a prototype, a big green bin with a hatch and a crank sitting at the base of the lamp. During the day, dog walkers tossed the doo-doo down the hatch, crank it five times to stir it all up, and head off on their merry way. Down in that hopper, magic happens. Not really. It's biology and chemistry and physics. 
you can think of the microbes as munching, but we science nerds, we call it fermentation. Their food is that organic matter and their waste is 60% methane and 40% carbon dioxide with a smidge of hydrogen sulfide. Now I'll tell you this book, it has footnotes and the footnote says that hydrogen sulfide, that's the rotten egg smell, P-U. The gas gets stored in a tank. The leftovers, we call it digestate, drip down in a pipe and can be used as fertilizer. At night, a sensor flips the switch, releasing methane from the tank and flick, the lamp is lit. Today, dogs and their walkers pass Brian's lamp on purpose. One gal drives in from miles away to walk six dogs. No sense in toting all those stinky by eggs home. Did I mention that Brian's story went viral? People from all over the world, a TV station in Japan, a guide dog training center, a park in Pennsylvania, they all come there to discover how to use dog doo-doo too. Brian's not done tinkering yet. What's next? Making the canine biodigester look like a dog. <gasps> Open up the mouth, drop in the poop, let the digest dribble out on the tail end, plant pretty flowers in that. And what about a barbecue? Hot dogs cooked by the doggy do? Uh, Brian's even got plans for the pipe, the leftover carbon dioxide into a greenhouse to grow bigger and better tomatoes, or maybe compress it into a cylinder to use in fizzy drinks. Don't you want a swig, right? <laughs> Almost three hours later, I was through with our conversation, but my cheeks hurt because I had been grinning so much. Think of what Brian's brain power had earned him. Number one, a street without doggy do. In the UK where he lives, about 700,000 pounds of puppy poo are produced in a year. The note says in America, it may be closer to 10 million tons a year. A landfill, the second thing you get. A landfill not filled with poopy bags. In a landfill, microbes convert poo into methane. If released into the atmosphere, methane is 20 to 30 times more potent in trapping heat than carbon dioxide. And number three, a fossil fuel free flicker to light his street. Just 10 bags of doo doo provide an hour of light. Homegrown green power. Man, I was so excited about what who could do. This was amazing. But again, my research was not exactly as planned. You see, all of these people poo stories kept popping up. I was not interested in people poo. I mean, animal poo is amazing. We can learn their stories, but this stuff was gross. I mean, there were the college students who were looking at astronaut poo. They created that slurry. The reason they wanted to create wrenches on Mars. What? I had to look at that just a little bit, right? What they were doing is they were growing bacteria from the astronaut poo. And that bacteria, they had messed with it a little bit, so it grew plastic. And then they could put that plastic into a 3D printer and print a wrench. Well, that was pretty cool. But again, no, people poop, just disgusting. And then there was this story. Everything is awesome, don't forget the Lego. This came from a serious scientific journal. Um, six scientists decided that they wanted to understand gut passage time. Gut passage time is, you know, how long it takes to go through. And they, they just decided to use their own bodies as their experimental tools. And little Lego heads. So they each swallowed a Lego head and then every day they, mm, yeah, they stick stirred through their poop to find how long it took to come out. What? I mean, crazy scientific studies, but it's actually pretty important, right? Like if you accidentally swallow the wrong thing, you wanna know how long it's in there. And then there was this story. This was the story of a poop train. 
a poop train that started in New York and New Jersey and drove all the way to my home state of Alabama. 50 train loads full of human feces got stuck in a little town. Now, I was not interested in this story. I did not want to know. But how could you ignore that much poop sitting in someone's backyard? This book didn't go as exactly as planned. I wanted to be looking at all of these cool animals. And human poop stories kept popping up. This is what I want to be doing, out on an island tracking some fox feces. Meeting an endangered species, right? Touching an endangered species. That's where I wanted this story to go. But this one, when a friend called me with a possum that was dead, and I decided I had to understand an omnivore's gut, you know, the beaver was an herbivore, and I had looked in carnivore guts, and I needed to know about an omnivore. This species right here, this possum, made me face up to my own bias. Because deep down in her gut, there was a parasite. And I, I wasn't willing to face it. This book took me in a full circle. Let me go read you one section. This is from towards the end of the book, but it references an experience I had at the very beginning of the book. I had uh, found some bat guano, and I had been examining the bat guano under a microscope. And I want to talk just a bit about how writers need to be open to their own personal experiences. Because I had an experience with that bat guano. It was full of phenomenal insect parts, and I love bugs. But I didn't, I didn't get any answers from it. And it had been eating me for months. Later, it was... 3.21 a.m. when I gave up and dragged myself out of bed. My brain was roiling with unanswered questions. There was no way it was going to let me get any Z's. Hoping for peace, I pulled out a book on poetry. From the top of the page, a quote shouted at me. The question is not what you look at, but what you see by Henry David Thoreau. My mind scrolled back to that day I had puzzled through the hodgepodge of insect parts, the day that a yellow knob filled with windows and prisms had caught my attention, the day I had tried to put hoop together like the photo on the outside box of a jigsaw puzzle. Sitting there in that darkness, with the darkness trying to swallow me whole, I knew there was so much more to poop than a pretty picture. Sitting there in the darkness, I wondered, what if all this time I had been seeing the wrong thing? Focused on the bits and pieces, I had let unanswered edges slice away at my attention. Maybe if I step back, I would see it more like a collage as a piece of poetry, a stained glass window? What if each scat is just a little piece of a larger idea? What if each study could shine new light on that idea? What if the right answer is to keep sticks stirring through tough questions, to pick up an insect eye, and to willingly see the world through a new lens? That's what writing this book taught me. You see, there are these hard things in life. Animals get hit on the road. Animal species that are going extinct. And we 
turn away from them. Poop itself is so disgusting, right? I mean, look at this little cutie. You can't really see it because of the, there you go, right? And what do we want to do? We want to turn away from it. We want to wall it off. We want to get it away. But the tough questions, questions like dealing with my own bias, didn't come to me until I looked and looked and looked and stirred through those tough things. And I think that that is what writing can do for each of us if we're willing to go there. I want to say thanks for all this fun you've been having. Um, I do have some uh, who's who, but I, Les might have some questions for me. So, um, do you want to do you want to go to some Q and A, Les, or should we should we look at who's who? We can go do either one. Who's who sounds pretty interesting to me, although I do have a couple of questions. <laughs> well, why don't we do a question or two, and then maybe we'll look at who's who. Okay, one of the things that, that I, that, that, what a fascinating presentation, first of all. And, you know, as I read the book, not only did you talk about the scientific part of poop, but you, you explored animals themselves and introduced some new animals to me that I had not heard of. In fact, I was wondering, I, I had never heard of the pangolin before, and you I mentioned know. that they are so uh, sought after. Why? What are the scales used for? If that's why people are going after them, what, what is the significance of, of the scales? There is some misunderstanding out there about what the proteins in their scales can do. Um, and some people believe that it has a healing power, but in fact, it's the same kind of stuff as in our fingernails. Um, and so um, unfortunately, um, it's used um, and sought after. And not only the scales, but the meat is actually sought after uh, in some high-end dining. And it's, it's pretty tragic because there, there are just not many of them out there. There are six different species of pangolin in Asia and I believe, wait, I think uh, in Asia and Africa. And um, they're so secretive. No, literally the people who were studying this creature couldn't even get their hands on poop to train the dogs. They had to go all the way uh, to Asia before they were able to get their hands on poop to train their dogs. And then they couldn't find the scat because, well, you can't find the pangolins, then you can't find their scat. And it's just this vicious cycle. It was crazy. But these folks are dedicated, right? Like they're not giving up. Even just, you know, figuring out how to get the DNA out of the poop, that's a different process for every single animal. Um, and that's tough work, but thankfully we have some dedicated scientists out there. Were there species in your research that were new to you? Oh yeah. I, I, I did know about the pangolin because I had referenced them in my earlier work, but I didn't know about all these species and oh my goodness, <laughs> the Allegheny wood rat. Oh my goodness. I literally flew to New York to meet a rat. And I had a bad attitude. I love animals. Don't get me wrong. I love all kinds of species, but rodents, I'm just like, okay, it's a rat, really? But I had that animal in my hand and she was phenomenal. Like, it's a connection you make with an individual that can totally change your bias, right? And I think that's true in so many parts of our life. I, I had an Go ahead. I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I was just going to say, I'll bet you learned a lot about different cultures of the world by doing this book. I did, right? And it is phenomenal. It opens my eyes. And again, the thing that came back and kind of kind of bit me in this book is I didn't realize my own bias. And as humans, bias is a part of us. It's how we stay safe, right? Like, I mean, we react to a snake because... Our bias tells us a snake can hurt us. And that's true. A snake can hurt us, but most snakes don't hurt us. And no snake has ever hurt me. However, I still react, right? So interesting thing is to recognize that that's human nature. That's how our brains work. But then consciously say, wait, I'm in control of my actions, right? And that is how we can address these bigger issues is we can be willing to turn 
towards them, not away from them. And um, I think that's an important, important message for all of us. I have one quick question before we get to who's poo, but uh, you were asking for fecal stories. Yeah. The, one that, the one that came to mind in my in my life is that I believe there must be a psychology about the whole subject. Um, <laughs> we had two dogs. One was a beagle. He was always getting in trouble. His name was Travis. And we had a, a sort of a retriever mix. He was a large mutt, but mainly a golden retriever. Well, uh, throughout the whole time I had these dogs, uh, the one that was in the getting in all the trouble, the beagle, got blamed for everything, including pooping in some really clever places where he thought we wouldn't see it. Now, I thought that's, you know, as, as bad as this is, and, and I disciplined him to some extent, I, you had to, but I had to give him credit for being clever. Well, the big dog died, and all of a sudden that behavior stopped. And I wondered if it was really the big dog that was doing this and Travis was getting the blame for it. So that, that to me is the only one I can, that comes to my mind. <laughs> Oh, that's so true. And like blame over poop is a right. huge thing, right? That's a big, big deal. And I believe there's a lot of animal psychology, especially pets. Um, you know, animals use their poop as a marker. I actually talked to this uh, scientist in Africa. She was awesome. She was studying the painted wolf and they needed to keep painted wolf uh, groups away from each other. And so what the scientists did is they built a wall of poop, not a literal tall wall, they just built a line of poop from one set of dogs, and then the other set of dogs refused to cross it. And so how cool is that, right? Like that they knew to use this power of poop to protect these animals. It was amazing. We do have a question from a viewer, and Roslyn wants to know, humans give doctors samples to detect problems. What do animal samples provide that's comparable? And then we oh have just a short everything, break. everything. It is so amazing. So you may have heard about fecal transplants. I don't know if you've gone there yet, but that's a chapter of the book. Oh my goodness, where you can actually transplant the feces from one human to another, and it's literally saving lives. I met a young lady whose life was saved thanks to her brother's poo. Ooh. But of course, you know me. I want to know what animals this is working for koalas koalas they're very picky you know they only eat eucalyptus but there's several species of eucalyptus well the problem is when koalas are in a preserved area and they eat all the eucalyptus of the species they prefer they will literally starve before eating the other eucalyptus but the other eucalyptus actually is nutritious for them they just choose not to eat it so a scientist said wait a second there's some koalas that are willing to eat this eucalyptus but you're not so they took the feces from the koala who was willing to eat that other species and transplanted it into the koalas that weren't. And all of a sudden they would eat it. What, right? Scientists use feces from zoo animals all the time. How do you know when, uh, um, when an elephant or a rhino or a hippo is ready to have baby? Yeah. That's their poo. I got to talk wow. to this lady who, that's what she does. They ship poo samples, all, all the zoos ship poo, poo samples, and she assesses them and, and tracks their hormones. It's amazing what happens when we look at this stuff. Sorry, I geek out on the, on the science. That's just who I am. I can't, I can't imagine what we've missed by not looking at poo, right? It's fascinating. We had one more question. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Kathy wants to know why owls throw up pellets and other animals poop. Is it just owls or do all birds do that? Good question. So owls are amazing in that, and, and raptors, they're amazing in that they eat these bodies whole, but their body isn't designed to process the bones and the feathers. And so, yeah, they regurgitate that. Um, it's just a, it's just a system. Now, if you take something like those painted, those hyenas, oh my goodness, those guys, their digestive system is totally designed to dissolve that stuff. So it goes right through them. And the thing is, we all have the same basic track, but what I didn't get is how unique and how specific every species digestive tract is, but also every individual's. Because from the moment you're born, literally as you are born, you are gaining microbes 
into your digestive system. And that affects the rest of your life. We didn't really know that until recently. Um, just bizarre. Good question, Kathy. Yeah, good question. Heather, our time is about up. So I just want to thank you for participating and for sharing some fascinating information. And, and it's opened up a new world for me, I have to say. So thank you. And also, at this point, if we were at the festival itself, we would take you to the signing booth where you would sign your books. Right now, I just want to tell people that Parnassus Books has your books here in Nashville, and they're also online. So if people want to get a copy of the book, go to Parnassus Books, and you can find them. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for uh, the questions that came in. And thank you so much, Heather Montgomery, for being with us today. I'm Les Thanks. Kerr for the, for the Southern Festival of Books. Thank you to the Southern Festival of Books. I appreciate it. And Parnassus, they have autographed books. So thank you so much.